Chapter 27 Yalmoth and his corps of Phyrexian guards reached Halcyon's 5th aerial port just before the stone chargers did. It was lucky. The port was over on with Thran. Wrath and Vengeance, Yalmoth's last personal caravels, were captured. A crew of minotaurs swarmed the decks. Some carried dead crew to lay decorously on the dock. Others gathered and inspected the weapons of the fallen. A few charged the ship's ray cannons. They were getting ready to cast off to use these ships against the city that created them. I should have told Gix to defend this spot first, Yalmoth hissed. Gix was commanding the defense of the upper city. Yalmoth bitterly drew his sword. He turned to one of the Phyrexian guard, a woman with filed teeth and wide eyes. Tell the bomb crews to wait on the stair, out of sight, with the doors bolted until the ships are secure. As she departed, Yalmoth stormed onto the floating deck. Ten Phyrexians followed. They charged the Minotaur who carefully tended the dead. One could not surprise the Minotaur. Bullmen were cannily alert. Deadly horns, fiery eyes, snorting nostrils, and a chest as broad as a wagon bed. The Minotaur rose to his feet before the onslaught. He drew steel in both hands, his nails as ebony as hooves. Yalmoth leapt to attack, tangling his weapon with the Minotaurs. The power stone in Yalmoth's sword flared with each echoing blow. It should have sliced right through the bull's blade, except the beasts also bore power stone swords. He had evidently liberated them from the fallen guards. Yalmoth could not surprise the Minotaur, but he couldn't punch the beast's honor. Ah, oh, the looting bodies? The red fire in the Minotaur's eyes turned to blue. I am guarding them, preparing them for burial. Yalmoth charged and while the Minotaur explained, shoving the beast off balance and onto one foot, dangerously near the edge of the dock. Stripping them of weapons isn't preparing them for burial. Warriors should be buried with their weapons. The bull man had just regained his footing and fought forward when the verbal blow came. And it had been a blow. Yalmoth had worked along these creatures. He knew their strict codes of conduct. Warriors, even enemy warriors, were to be buried with their weapons. These swords came from stores below decks, the Minotaur managed, landing a skinning attack on a shoulder plate. Yalmoth lurched beneath the blade, twisted, and pulled free. Next you'll be going through their pockets. Next you'll be stripping their clothes. The blue flames became white. The Minotaur roared and lunged. He had overcommitted. Yalmoth stepped back, letting the creature crash past. He swung his blade, sinking it into the creature's side. Even gushing blood, the beast rolled and lashed out. Yalmoth received the attacks as though the Minotaur merely handed him items he had requested. What are you going to do next? Run with the dead, you filthy beast? There was no roar this time. So intense was the Minotaur's hatred. He barged, bloody, into Yalmoth and flung him to his back beside the dead. In three-fingered hands, swords whirled. Powerstone blades sank into flesh. It was all Yalmoth could do to knock back the blows. He was losing. He had enraged the beast, but not enough to get the better of him. Until... You care nothing for these warriors. Guarding them? Preparing them for honorable burial? Minotaurs know nothing of... Honor. The beast hurled the power stone blade down to cleave Yalmoth's head. At the last moment, Yalmoth rolled aside, and the sword cleft the head of one of the dead men. It was sliced through the skull and into the pier beneath. The sword was stuck, gripped not by wood, but the stupid incredulity of the beast. He had desecrated the honor dead, the very ones he had been given to guard. Next moment, he joined them. Yalmoth's sword pierced the minotaur's belly and carved upward through the gut and rib and lung to slice open his ripe, red heart. Even as the massive warrior crashed down beside the human dead, Yalmoth rose. He was mantled in blood, his own and the blood of the bull. Only his power stone sword shone cleanly. A whoop went up behind him. Yalmoth turned, seeing his Phyrexian guard had made similar work of the other minotaurs aboard Vengeance. Some of the warriors were busy pitching dead bodies over the rail. Others cut a loose trophy for their belts or sack for their mouths. Their captain was the one who had whooped. She shouted, Vengeance is secure! Wrath is secure! Came another shout. The dock is secure! Yalmoth ordered the captain, Tell the crews to bring the bombs. Send a messenger to find Commander Gix and order him to drive the refugees from the temple. The captain acknowledged the orders and rushed off on Yalmoth's bidding. Meanwhile, Lord Yalmoth strode up the gangplank of vengeance, dripping gore. It was a very old image of death bodies and blood. Soon he would redefine the image of death, he and his nine stone chargers. They would make death a thing of pure white, 
even without bones to sully the desert. He would scour it of the mistakes of the past. In white fire, he would annihilate the whole Thran army. He was gone. Oh, the bliss of it. The monster was gone. He had torn through every fiber of her, raked every nerve, threshed every thought. No, not every thought. He had stolen every thought but one. If he had known that one thing, he would have possessed her utterly. And no one wants to be possessed utterly. She had once loved him. That was the secret. She hid it in plain sight, masking it in the name of hate. Now, it was hate. Love was gone. Now and forevermore. It was hate. A moment before, she could have not thought such a thing about Yamoth. In the secret place, though, Rebecca could think clearly. Her will remained. For that secret place flowed rage, which filled the raw void he had left her in. It stung like bitter spirits, but it also warmed her. She halted the advance of that angry tide. There was one thing that remained to be done before she let it fill her completely. I must do it. While there is still enough of his smell in me, I must do it now, when the world still thinks I am he. Rebecca summoned Phyrexia. She reached out for the world. She expanded her being outward and felt attentively to take hold of her. It knew she was not Yamoth, but it sensed its master in her being, in her blood, and it responded tentatively. Rebecca did not flow on the tides of the world as Yamoth did. Her essence did not convert itself to the blood of Phyrexia. Still, she could feel the pulse of the land and sense what it sensed. She searched through it, her mind determined and yet frightened. Phyrexia knew she searched and wondered what she searched for. I seek my love, was what she thought. The world was mollified. It told her Yalmoth had ascended. Rebecca did not see seeking, a sad and grieving child. The world allowed her her grief. It allowed her to search. Then she found him. Not Yalmoth, but Glaceon. He was in the same raised laboratory as Dyfed. He had just arrived. The four red-robed vat priests were busy arraying him on the adjacent pallet. His white casket lay nearby, the life-supporting mechanisms gingerly positioned around him. Priests moved with withered limbs with reverence and buzzed excitedly. One of them was very slowly, very carefully, drawing a line from the middle fingertip of his right hand, up the arm and onto the shoulder, except he wasn't drawing the line. He was incising it. Beads of ruby blood welled up slowly from the cut mark. Terror, like a drug, moved through Rebecca. The vision faded. She sensed uncertainty in Phyrexia. The whole withdrew from the touch of her mind. Her terror repelled it. A foreign thing. Yamoth never felt terror. He wanted to do it himself, Rebecca projected into the cloud of doubt that hissed around her. He will be furious when he discovers what they have done. There was a pause in that great mind. Yamoth did not feel terror, but Yamoth's servants felt it. Deep terror was the soul of Yamoth's greatest servants. This one, this Rebecca, must have been his greatest servant. Who else would he invite into the inner sanctum? Who else would smell so pervasively of him? What shall we do? The mist that had separated Rebecca from the world was thinning. She had to be careful now. Any more suspicion might break the tenuous lie. What does the master do to those who disobey? He kills them. Then let it be done as he would do it, Rebecca responded. The thought was no sooner formed than Rebecca felt the four dark souls wink from existence. She could see them. Yalmoth's four greatest eugenicists slumped down one by one. They did not clutch their hearts, but their thighs, hands over the Phyrexian heartstone implanted there. She felt not only their dying souls, but the wet rupture of organs within them. Muscle spasm. Cut of the jagged ends of broken bones. Their own musculature became great gizzards, grinding bones and innards into a digestible paste. They weren't the only ones dying. Dyfed, too, began at last to die. The death of her attendants meant her own death. Rebecca was relieved to feel it happening. The world mind grew distressed. Yalmoth was finished with her. Rebecca lied. He had learned all he could from her. He sought the planeswalking organ. The vat priest had scrambled it when they scrambled her brain. Incompetence. It is why he brought Clayson here. His planeswalking organ. She stopped, glimpsing the truth in her mind of Phyrexia. Clayson was an ascent planeswalker. It was why Dyfed came to visit him. It was why Yalmoth had kept him alive so long and brought him here to dissect. Struggling to maintain the easy tone of her thoughts, Rebecca continued. It's still active. That is why Yalmoth wanted to cut him open, himself. There was a belief and understanding in the great mind. He too will die, if left unattended. 
Through Rebecca's mind flash images of the myriad vat priests working the catwalks nearby. Some of them lifted their heads, as though hearing a silent thought. No, Yalmoth was to do it himself. He is not here. He is in Halshan. I will take Glaceon to him. Move me to the laboratory. I will pack Glaceon in his healing capsule. You will take us to the portal, and I will take him to our master. There was suspicion again in that vast mine. Rebecca let her once love for Yalmoth roll out into a lying flood. Immediately, the darkness of the inner sanctum sifted away. Rebecca stood in a nine-sided laboratory of polished steel. Her lacerated husband lay on the shelf on one side. Dyfed died quietly on the other. Four bat priests were dead heaps on the floor. Rebecca knelt beside her husband and staunched the blood flow from his wound. She lifted him. He was only a bag of bones. Cradling him, she took him to the healing capsule. All the while she worked, arranging life support mechanisms, she felt the mind of Phyrexia press upon her, watching uneasily. The moment the casket was closed, Rebecca and Glaceon dissolved away. They reappeared on the first sphere, the fungus city spreading to one side and the great black portal to the other. Not waiting for the world to change its mind, Rebecca hefted the end of the white casket and dragged it, hissing across the grassy ground. She watched the blue sky as she went, waiting for a bolt to leap down out of it and slay her and Glaceon at last. The foot of the coffin grafted on stone. She looked about. She stood within a dark cave beside the mirror podium and steel and glass book. Phyrexia was only a blinding and horrible vision through the portal. The caves of the dam were the most wonderful sight Rebecca had ever seen. Now to scare up a few goblins to help hoist this thing to the city. Heaving the capsule, Rebecca dragged it away from the gateway. She would take Glaceon above, but not to Yalmoth. She would take her husband to the temple they had designed. Once within, they could fly away from all of this madness. It was a beautiful thing to fly this away. There were no Thran ships in the sky. The Phyrexian fleet was minuscule, but nine caravels was enough. Yalmoth led them from his own warcraft, Vengeance. He did not even command Vengeance. Not in words. Not in orders. The crew knew what he wanted. Pinpoint accuracy was not critical with stone chargers. He gave no orders. They would have soured the taste of wine in his mouth. They would have pulled his attention away from the spectacle unfolding below. The Thran and their allies filled the desert on all sides. Their forces stretched away to the mountains in the west and the hills in the east. It seemed the whole world had risen in outrage against a single city, poisoned the heavens within reach of the gods. Of course they would. These violent beasts. Half cows, half cats, half lizards, studded dwarfs, and wilting elves, and thick-browed men. The Phyrexians had risen above them all. They had climbed the chain of being and were ready to ascend that last step. Let the rest descend. Yama thought, staring down at the mowing multitudes. Let them all descend. The first bomb, silver in the sunlight, tumbled free of vengeance. It toppled end over end. The flashes from its fins swept over the army of dwarves below. They looked up from the crude assault engines, paused beside their laboring donkeys, and gaped at the sparkling doom that fell on them. The bomb righted itself, pointed downward. Its fins gave it a spiraling descent. Soon, it was but a silver spot against the staring army. Then, it was nothing at all, only its shrieking whistle reaching vengeance and her lord. A white smile spread across his face, as if in answer, a white circle formed below. It spread outward with the speed of the dilating eye, a uniform disk of force. The dwarves silently disappeared in that cloud. In moments, it had flashed the base of the extrusion and out to the mountains on the far side. Its center swelled upward in a tremendous bulge. From the middle rose a fat column of force. Traces of burning things shot into the air beside the super hot column. Killing clouds rose in rings around the spot. Beautiful, Yama said, sipping his wine. Only then did the sound of the explosion reach vengeance. The craft jolted, seized in a giant hand of noise. It was omnipresent. It was too loud to hear. It swept past, enveloping all the world in thunder. A second bomb rolled from the ship, over the armies of humans doing their best to flee from the first blast. There would be plenty of fleeing today, but no escape. The humans died as suddenly and spectacularly as the dwarves. There were seven more bombs left. One for each city-state and one for Yalmoth, he quoted. He sipped his wine and watched his foes dissolve in a pure, scouring whiteness.